Caution, this article and video contain possible spoilers. Lorne McDougall of Glasgow is one of the world's most innovative and accomplished Celtic musicians, performing on various instruments, including, most importantly, the Highland Pipes. He's an in-demand musician for television and movie soundtracks and scores, and his latest project is one of his biggest, coordinating and performing the Highland Piping for the final episodes of the celebrated Netflix series, The Crown. McDougall's screen productions include Dune, How to Train Your Dragon, Whiskey Galore, Thunderbirds, Brave, and Doctor Who. He's worked with top-flight recording artists like Susan Boyle and has been a member of the Tannehill Weavers and the Red Hot Chili Pipers. While his on-screen appearances in The Crown are brief, his piping plays a central and culminating part in the final episodes of the six-season series. McDougall's work on the program brings high-quality piping to a massive worldwide audience, and his role as an advisor in the production puts our too-often-misrepresented instrument in a spectacular light. His playing of Queen Elizabeth II's favorite tune, Sleep, Deary Sleep, is so poignant that it brings lead actor Imelda Staunton, who plays the Queen, to tears. Just as it did when the sovereign piper, pipe major Paul Burns, moved an audience of billions with his piping at the real queen's funeral. The role and power of the piping in the crown can't be understated, exposing millions more worldwide to the Highland Pipes as they are meant to be heard. We wanted to know more about his work in the crown, and Lauren McDougall took time from his busy schedule as a performer, teacher, and composer to fill us in, starting with how the whole project came about. The Crown was actually just an open audition for the role of the Queen's Piper. Um, so it was an email that got circulated about a bunch of pipers and they were looking for a big burly Scotsman. Uh, so I thought, well, that's that's possibly something I could do, but I had no acting experience. The last acting gig that I would have had would have been as a wise man in a primary school <laughs> nativity play. So I think what I, what I really wanted to do was just to get my foot in the door. And, and there'd probably, I thought, be an opportunity to do some actual piping in it. So I thought the worst that could happen is that I don't get the gig and the gig goes to an actual actor uh, and maybe I could do some some overdubs. That was sort of what I was hoping to get at the time. That's what I expected to get at the time. But somehow things went really well for me with the, the acting. Um, I got a, a, a very short acting lesson uh, from an actor friend called Tom Urie, who's um, done a few things like um, Still Game. Um, and he he did a, a read through of the script. He read the lines, and we did a self tape, and gave me some advice on on how to to talk naturalistically, which is a new word that I discovered while doing it. So that's basically talk talking like you're saying something for the first time, which I wasn't doing. Uh, I didn't realise that until someone pointed it out to me. So that that then led to an actual audition in London on the set with the director. Um, by a very, very, very big deal of luck, um, I was actually in, in London doing a Remembrance Day parade or a Remembrance Day service. Um, so I was down with my kilt and with all my gear, with my pipes, and I mentioned it to the, the woman that was dealing with the casting and said, I'll be in London. Anyway, uh, is that going to be an advantage? And she said, yes, absolutely. So come along, have a read through the lines with the director, play a couple of tunes. So that happened. Um, and then I got a call a few days later saying you've got the gig. McDougall's work on the production extends far beyond what we see on screen, not only providing the sound of the pipes, but also working to portray the instrument accurately. He talks about his overall role and how it took shape with different directors. Basically, I ended up having two different roles um, over two different episodes. So episode six, um, and, and obviously if anyone's not watched it, I'll, I'll be speaking about some of the, the things that go on. So if you've not watched it and you, you don't want it spoilt, um, I would go and watch it now first. But the the this sort of the plot in episode six, um, one of the subplots is that the, the Queen has got to lose some staff members. Um, so one of the, the staff members that, that's job is in question is the Piper to the Sovereign, the, the Queen's Piper, as it's, it's more commonly known. Um, and that that was up against a couple of other slightly, well, more questionable jobs. I think most people would realise like, there was jobs there like the Warden of the Swans or the, the Queen's Guide to the Sands. They're also two real jobs. 
that were getting questioned and, and the the Piper one was also um under threat. So my role in that episode originally was to explain the job the role of the Piper and, and what what the Queen's Piper does. So they didn't use a lot of what, what we filmed um that did originally go into a bit more history. Um I think I think the reason for that was because the Piper then returns in a later episode. Uh, the final episode actually um and the the director for that episode was a different director and he had a, a different vision for the piper and also wanted a, a trained actor to do it not just me who who has got that other one thing on my cv from a primary school nativity play <laughs> so the role then changed um uh, rather than having it as um rather than me play the part i ended up being a piping advisor was the the or bagpipe advisor was the title that they gave me so that involved training the actor who had never touched a set of bagpipes in his life. That involved getting him to look convincing. Uh, and that and that was a number of different sort of techniques we used to make that happen. So first, first of all, the prop had to be right. So the bagpipe had to be right. So I had no problem loaning him my pipes. Um, so... To make sure that the pipes looked realistically, little corks in the drone tuning pins, um, so obviously you don't see them. Um, I've actually got a really cool um, stock on my chanter that not many people use or are really even aware of um, that I got from Ayrshire Bagpipes that cuts it. So it's a, it's a, I can't remember what it's called, but it's, it basically means that if you twist it, there's no way of going to the chanter. So that part was was easy to cut off. We just cut it off and moved the chanter around. Um, and with that, it meant that the bag could be inflated. Uh, the actual look of the bagpipes came from um, Alistair at Bagpipe Covers. Um, so we just got in touch with him saying we need the pipes to look good. And I think it was actually him that provided them anyway in real life. So he um, got the pipes looking amazing. And because both me and the actor, the actor's a, a, a great guy called Paul Tinto, um, we we both really wanted it to look convincing, um, so we ended up trying to get the fingers to look good as well. So I provided him with some diagrams of how to play the, the three tunes that are in it. Most importantly, would be sleep, dear sleep, um, and provided him with a recording. So we spent some time in a rehearsal studio with him, literally miming to my recording, but but doing a very very good job of it. Um, I honestly think that. Um, if if pipers were to see the fingers and they're they're not really shown that much in the end anyway, but if pipers were to see the the actual full takes that we were doing, they would believe that the actor was a an actual piper playing the pipes. So that was that was the on set stuff, and I was there every time you see a piper on screen. I was there shouting. Actually, I do believe I was singing Athol Highlanders at him to make sure it was at the same tempo we recorded it at. I think we recorded it at 80 BPM or something like that. So there's one shot when he's playing Athol Highlanders and it's a wide shot and I'm at the other side of the field shouting and clapping my hands to try and keep him in time. Um, and then, of course, I, I did the actual recording. Um, the Everything except for the last piece, the, the big finale, was actually also recorded on set. Um, so you'll hear it's not a particularly um, studio quality um, recording it's 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 quite rough and ready because it literally was just one microphone um recorded on the set and with not much time um uh, not much not the chance to do like seven or eight takes just like do it once or twice and if it's not good enough tough <laughs> but i mean the thing is with, with these sort of things where you know this is that the piper we're seeing you know on on camera that's playing it's not me that's playing it's it's we're hearing what the piper is dealing with on camera and actually those were cold November, December mornings outside the stately home um, outside London. So um, not the, the, the most ideal opportunity or um, atmosphere to be playing pipes in. We wondered if Lauren McDougall knew he would be part of several of the most moving and memorable scenes in the six season series. Uh, I knew it only went to 2005, um, but with... Um, Pipe Major Paul Burns doing such an amazing job at the the Queen's funeral in real life. Um, I thought they're probably going to hook on to that and do something with it. 
I didn't realise it was going to be quite such a massive part of it. Like the tune name is the episode name, but no. And that was that was only fairly recently that I went in to record that. So most of the filming was done at the start of the year or the end of last year, but that was only towards the end of the summer um, that I went in to do the um, the recording that was used at the end, the Sleep Daily Sleep recording. The numbers aren't known, but the worldwide audience for the final episode of the award-winning series would undoubtedly be in the tens of millions. Was Lauren McDougal conscious that he'd be bringing high-quality piping to such a massive viewership, and did he feel much pressure? Absolutely. I always, I always worry that it's not going to be done well, um, and it was. It, it drove me slightly. It, it was a bit torturous through the summer, you know, because you, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if maybe you're you're not in control of what happens after you film stuff. It's possible someone could have gone in and overdubbed my piping. Like it's quite possible I could be I could have acted and done my playing and someone could have gone in and overdubbed it. And that would have been totally fine. There was nothing I could get angry about. That's just how sometimes it works. But that was a fear that I had. I was worried that, that um they might hire someone that that, that maybe didn't sound the way I'd like to sound when I see myself on the screen. But that didn't happen. And actually, it's, it's, it is it's testament to how well that production company worked that that my message from the casting department went right up the tree and came back down the other side for the uh, music department, um, who, you know, quite possibly might not have spoken to each other and they could have just got gotten someone else in. I think there's there's a number of programmes guilty of... of presenting bagpipes uh, not at their best um, and the public hear that and don't like it but I, again I think we've got Paul Burns to thank for all of this um, that opportunity in the crown comes because he, he did that in, in real life so this is this jumping in the back of that doing the same thing and bringing, bringing pipes to, to people's attention and I have noticed on social media people commenting about it um, I even saw a very small meme saying that the only thing unbelievable about The Crown was that someone actually enjoyed hearing bagpipes in the morning. <laughs> but I think, um, I think yeah, it's it's very very much a, an appreciated thing that people, um, people have really enjoyed. And the whole point of that is hopefully they'll get into more bagpipes or learn, or their kids will learn, and it'll just be a good thing for, for the piping community in general. And finally, we asked Lauren McDougall how life as a Celtic recording artist, composer, and performer is going. It's, it's very varied. Uh, you know, the 2023 there was probably the most varied year that I've had um, working on The Crown. Uh, another TV programme for Amazon called Good Omens is another show that I, I did some pipes for. So that's sort of, that's two flagship shows for um, big streaming um, sites that I'm, I'm very pleased about. Um, of course, we had that... Um, Vale of Athol concert at Celtic Connections that started off the year. That was that was all. All three of those things were kind of going on at the same time. So uh, there was a lot, a lot happening, and then the the rest of the year was a bit more quieter. Um, I've got a couple of tracks. I recorded three tracks that I'm slowly getting around to releasing. I released the first of those on the fifth of November. There, called Bonfires of Aaron. So a similar sort of thing, trying to integrate pipes into orchestras. So this was a, a piece that, that I recorded with um, the Scottish Session Orchestra, um, got Gus Sicard playing pipe band snare in it, um, and a, a vocalist called Melanie Pappenheim, um, who's done a lot. Actually, um, by pure coincidence, is also in the Crown soundtrack. Um, so so that's The Bonfires of Aaron, um, which is out there. And then I've got another one that's... Um, coming out I don't know when this is just my own bad planning but another one that has also got the string section in it um, and a theremin so black pipes and theremin um, probably for the first time and then the final one is just 10 bagpipes all at the same time so there are two, two of them are in the can one of them is still to be recorded Our thanks to Lauren McDougall for sharing his insights and some of the behind the scenes secrets with Pipestrums readers and viewers. Stay tuned for more videos from Pipestrums. Mm -hmm.